Did you know he was framed? Well, I know that there are people who say that, and I've been reading no, the court I'm records. Telling. But I'm telling you, as we sit here now, Park, Zaya, Cadero, Smith, Crabby, Florio, I knew every name and I knew every one of those persons. Sonny was framed. From 1938 to 1966, he had been charged in, I think, a dozen cases and had beaten every one of them. This was the one case he couldn't beat. And this is the case that sent him to prison for a 50-year sentence. To this day, Sonny claims he was framed. Right. Do you think that's true? Yeah, I do. You think he was framed? Yes, I really do believe that. Yes, I do. Because there's a later trial that comes up, and he has a hearing, and he has it in federal court. And my husband testifies on behalf of Sonny and says that he lied. And I testify on behalf of Sonny and say basically that they lied. But Judge Mitchell didn't believe it. In 1966, prosecutors from four different offices brought cases against Sonny Francis. But the bank robbery case is the one that still defines Sonny to this day. Yeah, 50 years later, a lot of people still have questions about it. Sonny tried to appeal the bank robbery conviction nine times. And each time, Judge Jacob Mishler found legal reasons to deny them. Mishler became Sonny's lifelong nemesis. He was one of the few people Sonny could not bend to his will. Please believe me. I, you know, it's hard, I know it's hard to believe, but... He said, you know, of all the things I did, the thing I went to jail for, I didn't do. He was haunted, haunted. One meeting that all of this supposedly happened at, that my father was allegedly there at the meeting and told him to do all these things, three different cases, the whole bit. It was sensational even to believe that. My dad was a thousand percent in that case. He was no bank robber. Everybody swears to this day and you know, kind of tend to believe that maybe he didn't, I don't know. I didn't see anything exceptional in the record about Mr. Francesi's case that suggested that uh, he was um, wrongfully convicted. He was really convicted for being the mastermind behind the robberies. I don't think it's possible. You know, we, we play by the rules. He's done things that are far, far worse. These bank robbers were more like the gang that couldn't shoot straight. I think Charlie Zare was allegedly driving the getaway car and got confused and wound up back at the bank. And Zare's the last living connection to these bank robbers. What are the odds she goes on camera today? I don't know, but it's worth a shot. So there's a lot going on here, and all that intrigue, all that sort of inter interweaving uh, uh, bad actors in this illicit matrix. They'd love to come by your place, like maybe Monday. Either Friday or Monday. There was a time when there was supposed to be some meeting that was held, and my husband was supposed to be at the Sunny and everything, right. and he couldn't have been at the meeting because him and I were upstate with our children at that time. Uh, oh, the meeting so with the aqueduct. A, that's right, so there was no way my husband could have been there. He wasn't even in New York at that time. We were away on vacation. If there was ever a guy who called him as he saw him, it was Jack Mishler. So you don't think it's possible that he would have it in for Sonny Francis because of who he was? No, not at all. Okay. I'm, I'm, no, not at all. I'm, I'm laughing because he had a very level playing field, sometimes to the detriment of the government, uh, sometimes to the detriment of the defense, and sometimes to the displeasure of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> he taught people so much. He should have charged tuition, that's the way I'd put it. Hi, I'm looking for Ann Zier. Hi. Hi, she how are you? She went to the doctors. She, oh, she went this morning, but she's not back yet? Uh, I yeah. feel bad. Uh, so I'll tell her you stop by. Thank you. Thank you so much. She's not here, so we better tell Bobby. At the light, turn right onto Forest Parkway. 
What's remarkable about these four men, Charles Zare, John Codero, James Smith, and Richard Parks, is that they testified against Francis in three of the four cases that were brought against him in 1967. They alleged that Sonny said he would take over the running of the bank robberies. Now, Sonny says he never attended that meeting. He says he was never there and that he doesn't know those guys. And what happened after the bank robbery conviction, there were so many twists and turns in the story. Sorry you made the trip for nothing. No, it was okay. okay. And at that time, I had a letter in my possession that I had smuggled out of jail to bring to Tommy Mattia, who I'd met. Right? Right. right and right. in the letter, it had said how basically they were cooking up this whole entire story and that the man was innocent. The problem with that letter is that Charles and his wife Anne had a fight over that letter and she burned it. Charles there recreated the letter and Sonny used that in a subsequent motion that Mishler denied. Why did your husband initially testify against Sonny? He had to because the others were. It was a deal they made with the FBI to get less time in jail. He had no choice that the others were. He had no choice but basically to go along with it. Charlie Zaya's wife told us that, yeah, my husband participated in the frame and gave us a letter that he smuggled out from prison to give to her. And in the letter it said, I remember the two lines, we framed this guy Polisi and we had to frame this guy Sonny Francis too. Said it in black and white in the letter. A lot of people say Sonny was framed. Was he? I, I don't think so. But prosecutors and, and wise guys have different ways of looking at things. Sonny wasn't out there wearing a face mask and, and, and you know, going up and sticking guns in the temples of, of bank tellers and committing robberies. He wasn't there on the scene, as far as I know. But he would have, according to the testimony, would have said, okay, you have my approval, go out and do it. And they probably would have delivered some of the loot to him. So the boss would look at it and say, I didn't commit any bank robberies. But in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the prosecutor, they, the boss was guilty because the boss had to condone, had to sort of you know, put the imprimatur on the, uh, on the crime that the underlings wanted to commit, the crew wanted to commit. One thing, if we focus on the legal process, it, it's clear that the process was fair and not different from the process given to any other defendant in his position. Uh, he had an independent jury determine the facts. Uh, so uh, whether or not Judge Mishler uh, liked him, disliked him, is beside the point. He was convicted of it, so a jury thought he did it. I've been in, in this business for 44 years. Not once have I ever seen any law enforcement officer, especially the FBI, ever cut corners and have a theory where, you know what, I can't get him on this, but we'll make up something, we'll get him on that, because he, he did other bad things. I have never seen that in my entire career. Okay, yeah, I was a mob guy, yeah, I did other things, yeah, I got away with a lot of stuff. But, okay, get me for something I did. Uh, the four uh, participants, those who actually committed the robberies, did they have an incentive to rat out higher bosses? Of course. Is that something that was unheard of? Of course not. He's got a lot of bodies on him. Well, what's the count, 40 or 50? Either indirectly or directly, so. A life so, of crime. So it was good that he was away. I think I think it was good. Yeah, I think it's, it was good for for society. He did his time. He was under constant surveillance during that time in the early '60s. I remember them when I used to go to the ball field. They used to be in the in the baseball field with us, 24/7 surveillance. All we ever asked was for all those surveillance reports because they had to prove that he wasn't at the Q Motor Inn the night that they claimed he ordered the bank robberies. And that's the entire case. <laughs> I never heard of 24 hours surveillance on anybody. I've never heard of anybody doing 24 hours surveillance on anyone. Well, John Gotti, they weren't doing 24 hours surveillance on. Did you know Cordero Smith? Never saw him in my life. I could take a lie detector test. I beat them in three, and I couldn't beat them in them. I couldn't beat them in uh, the bank robbery. But they all come after me like I was the last uh, gangster in the world. This is you. It's a picture of you on the cover of Newsday. And then FBI nabs Francisi as super Dillinger. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I can laugh at? If you look at the headlines of the papers before I got this pinch, they had me down as the biggest Sherlock in New York. Right. They had me down as the biggest bookmaker. 
and some other things that made me very, very rich. How could I go and rob banks? It was a conspiracy to get me there. There's no question about it. Because I, I had no right to be indicted on a, a bank robbery job. Now I want to ask you another question. If I went robbing banks with them, they haven't a picture of me with them. They haven't got one telephone call with them. How did this, this stick that I knew them? I threatened to take truth serum with them. They wouldn't take it. Please believe me. I, you know, it's hard. I know it's hard to believe, but I never met them. I didn't know them. If Cadero, if you brought Cadero in with you now, I wouldn't know who the hell he was. But uh, they were believed than I was. So I, I, what could I do? I, I can't even. I can't even get enough evidence, even after the trial and everything, to, to, to prove my innocence. Huh? And I only get friendly with Eleanor, actually, after they get arrested, because we're going back and forth to see them. And it was really Eleanor that came up with this entire brainstorm, you know. To frame Sonny? Yes, it was. Remember the sit-down that was central to the bank trial. This was the sit-down that Sonny presided over, allegedly, and took over the bank robberies. That sit-down was triggered by Eleanor Cordero. Eleanor was Ernie the Hawk's wife, and about a year or so after his death, she married John Cordero, one of the bank robbers. They went to a bar one night, and Eleanor saw Whitey Florio, who was in Sonny's crew, and she accused him of killing her hawk. So outside the bar, a shootout ensued in which John Cordero shot at, at Whitey. He missed. He shot five times and he missed. After that, there had to be a sit-down. It's a serious offense to shoot at a wise guy, a member of Sonny's crew. This sit-down allegedly happened all because of Eleanor. Sonny said he never went, but at trial, the bank robbers said he did. Eleanor said you hated each other. Eleanor Cordero. Eleanor. I never hated him. How can I hate a guy? I don't know. She was mad because she wanted what, what, what my wife had. This is an interview with Manny Topol at Melville on March 1988. Look, my conversations with Green are endless. He literally made his reputation on Sunday. So he wasn't pissed at you for writing these stories saying that this was a frame up? He might have been, okay. because he feels that a murderer was going out and bad okay. guy. Okay. He just never really uh, showed <coughs> me that he was pissed. How did Manny come to start doing the Sonny Francis story? Tina Francis had information proving that he could not have been at this motel that he was accused of being in at that time. Because regardless of what my father did in the past, this case literally destroyed our family. And I have to point to this because, you know, he did all of this time and, and um, government has enough tools, enough weapons to get somebody honestly. And if they can't do that, then uh, they should move on, you know? At first, he didn't want to do the story. And some of the other investigative reporters uh, said, what difference does it make? He's a bad guy. Just leave him there. This particular crime he did not do. And I felt very strongly that if you're going to get him, you should get him for what he did and not for this. The government, the guys you talked to, they said they kept telling me it didn't matter. But no one really faced up to the fact, did he really do this? But the head of the parole commission said to me, did the Franzi's family ever put any pressure on you? Did he start, uh, no. Did they offer you any money, any threats? Uh, I said, no. The only threats I got were from the government. Fourth place for best investigative reporting. Yeah. 1988. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's nice. Tina had tried for so long that she began to call Manny her Moses. She was desperate to get her husband out of prison. She kept calling him and calling him, are you gonna do the story? What are you going to do about it? And, you know, I have, we have to get him out. He had no illusions about the type of person that Sonny was, but he felt that he shouldn't be in prison for something that he did not do. He told Tina, I will testify and I will write the story. 
and I will present the information that you've given me and uh, we'll see what happens. This is the article uh, about the gang that robbed banks of uh, framing Francis. Uh, well, shortly after the my parents approved parole board, he they did leave a little amount of parole. Afterwards, he thanked me. Uh, Who did uh, Francis? Yeah. So I went to court then, and he he was in manacles, and they took off the manacles, and he called me over, and he said, "Thanks." <laughs> I always had an angry feeling that he didn't do this particular crime. I think he's quoting Manny Topol. Court records and FBI files show that the family pulled out all the stops to get Sonny out of prison. There were threats, bribery attempts, and even doctored tapes. Uh, okay, this is really interesting. So this is his freedom of information request, which, by the way, is a pretty sophisticated thing to submit. They didn't give him anything. They denied his request. 1978 was the year he was paroled for the first time after Manny Topol testified on his behalf. So he gets out on parole, and yet four years later, he violates his parole. And this was a pattern that went on for the next three decades, where he would get on, out on parole, he would violate it. He'd get out on parole, he would violate it. He violated his parole five times. We went up to Great Neck. He was sitting at a restaurant and he was eating pasta fazool with a, a, a bunch of associates who he should not have been with. And we came up to him and I, and I said, Sonny, we, you know, we gotta arrest you, you know, parole violation. He looked at me, he says, can I at least finish my pasta fazool? So we sort of kind of laughed and said, no, you really can't finish the pasta fazool. You have to go with us. You know, my, my dad was violated five times, every time for association. It, it all stemmed from association no matter what. And he used to tell me, I've got to be careful who I'm around. You know, I don't want anybody to come. I, I was protective of him. But then it was his, if duty called, I had to go. And it's just remarkable, in and out of jail so many times. And the idea that he would ever cooperate with the FBI Let's just say he was disinclined to even entertain that idea. And for that, I, I respect him for that. He's like a purist. I didn't even make an attempt with Sonny. I didn't want to waste either of our time. My feeling is he had organized crime in his soul. He was just who he is. And he will always be that way. And he'll be going to his grave. That's who he, the man is. The first time I met him was at the table that day in front of the administrative judge at probation. And we're sitting across and I'm looking at him and uh, I even, I remember I even had a, an opportunity that, that day to say, Sonny, listen, I can make this, I can make this headache go away for you. Nah, you know, that's not what I do, that's not me, that's not me, so. But that wasn't the first time I tried. There were two more, but by the fourth time, the, the last arrest. I just didn't want to insult the guy, so I didn't even ask him. Even when he was convicted, the guilty verdict comes in, and he just like takes his wallet out and like hands it over to somebody. He was just a, you know, like a man's man. He was like a guy that that it was in this bubble, and there was something pure about a person like that, and why I was convinced he was going to survive his sentence. Everyone thought it was a death sentence. I said, you know, if there's one person who will survive just out of spite for the government, it'll be sunny. I mean, getting violated five times is just, it's almost absurd. I mean, it's just, it, it, well, it's almost he had no discipline, no self-control. I mean, maybe it's almost as if he wanted to go back to prison. If you were risking going back to prison by associating with, with underworld figures, um, why would you do that? I mean, it's just, you'd have to be more careful. You'd have to be more disciplined. Judge Mishler sentenced Sonny to 50 years in prison, and it was a sentence clearly designed to get Sonny to cooperate with authorities, but he never did. After he went away, his family fell apart. Each one of them entered his or her own personal hell. They wanted me to roll all the time. But, but you didn't. I can't do that. Why not? See, because it's my it's my principle. How can I lie how can I lie against people and lies about me? 
How can I lie about them? I suffered all my life. My family suffered. Now I go along and I do the same thing to somebody else. I couldn't do it. I, I, I'm not a hypocrite. Well, why should I lie about people? Never happened. They were, they were terrible people. Mishler, I wish I meet him in hell. He's, he's in hell, I know that. Because he lied about a murder, he lied about the robbery, he lied about everything. You know, you know, Cordero. Smith, Zare, and uh, Parks. Them four, four, them four guys. They know I, they know I didn't do it, because they were the guilty guys. They got five years, you got 50. Yeah. I done 30 some odd years on kind of that case. What did your time away do to the family, do to your family? What? What did your time away do to your family, to your wife? Destroyed them. Really? What could have done that? We destroyed them.